my mouth and out family we are live in south by southwest texas austin texas it's a lot going on my first time in the mix his first time in the mix right now i'm here with the show uh, uh 912 king you know 912 king so i was debating i was like i wonder how he says his name is it like 912 king or nine you know what i'm saying but uh so it's 912 king yeah how did that name come about so 912, that's the um that's the area code, you know, for my city. I'm from Brunswick, Georgia, you know, land of the wicked, you know, a king. That's just, you know, my nickname. So I just combine the two and it flows, you know. Kind of nice and yeah, it's nice. It does roll off the tongue, man. And um, so you do music, right? Yes, sir. I do music, hip hop. I'm an artist. I rap. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to say I cliche, but it is what it is. I rap. <laughs> Um, so if you had to describe your music, how would you describe your music for a person that's never heard it? Um, you know, people normally kind of like, everybody's influenced by somebody, so if I had to kind of describe, it's kind of like a blend between like J. Cole and like Kendrick Lamar, that type of vibe. Spit. Spit and shit. Like put my, put my, like my own spin on it, of course. Hey. Um, okay, so <clears throat> how I like to start off my interviews is kind of touching on the artist's, uh, background. That way, so for people who may not know you, they can kind of understand a little bit of your uh, background. Um, so let's start off with talking about where you were born and where you grew up. So I'm born and raised Brunswick, Georgia. You know, that's where everything. That's where I learned everything. That's how I came up. That's where I, that's where I got my name from. You feel me? You know, that's, that's my stomping ground. What is it like there for someone that's never been there? Describe it. Brunswick is. It's real. It's pretty slow. It's slow pace, you know, compared to big cities and whatnot. But you have, you also have like the marshlands, and it's on the coast, so a lot of people from out of town come to visit, vacation and whatnot. A lot of old people, um, that's mainly kind of like retired. They actually they move there, they just kind of like you know finish their life off there type thing. Then uh, growing up, uh, what was your neighborhood like? Uh, so I grew up in a uh, Leesburg Circle. Neighborhood was fun. Uh, you know what I'm saying? There was a lot of kids in that neighborhood and whatnot. And uh, you know, I was just an outsider, so I was always outside playing around and whatnot. Just you know, being a kid, doing things like that. Telling my sister out because we had, she has a son, which is my nephew, but it is no kids in the neighborhood, <laughs> so he ain't got no reason to go out because I can't always go out with him. But I remember them days. It's good to have like other kids in the neighborhood. Um, so in your household, what was that like? Was uh your parents uh playing music at all or like man, my household, man, I grew up with my cousins and whatnot. Um, but yeah, my mom, like like when I think about it in hindsight, she used to always have like M and M C D or cassette tape, Tupac C D, uh cassette tape, uh fifty cent. She was real big on 50 Cent. That's when all the ladies love 50, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah so 50 and like the game and all them. So I, I was always around like hip hop, you know? Oh, she kind of put me on to that. And that's why I asked that because a lot of artists, <clears throat> they, you know, like you just said, in hindsight, you know, looking back, you realize like, okay, maybe this was actually like planting the seed for, you know, you getting into it. <clears throat> you know, 50 definitely was a good. Role model, that nigga. Uh, but Tupac, like, was the one. I he was the one that stuck and actually like made me feel like emotions from his music. So I remember like looking in the mirror, like reciting Tupac rhymes and shit. You know what I'm saying? Like just acting like portraying, you know, what I'm saying the life of a rapper. Like I remember that. That's crazy. That's dope. Um. Okay. So when did you kind of first start? Uh, actually, I guess writing your own raps or just trying to put together rhymes and stuff like that. You remember? Yeah. I mean, me and my homeboys, we used to always just play around. You know, you know how it is, bro. Just freestyling and yeah. shit. I feel like every black, you know what I'm saying, young black kid, you know what I'm saying? It was in Dallas and freestyling with rap and shit. But, uh, but um, when, what, uh, 
time frame is this? Is it like middle schools? Is high schools? Is that? It's from what I remember, it was like high school, like like mid high school and whatnot. Yeah, but um, like when I actually like started like putting a pen to paper, it's when I was uh, when I was like in college, like that's when I kind of took it serious. Yeah, I was up there in Boston doing like a master's program, and I was just kind of going through a rough spell with school. And I needed kind of like an outlet, and uh, so I just kind of focused on writing poetry and whatnot. You're doing a master's program yeah. for what? Uh, medical sciences. God damn. Yeah, so I was doing that um for like two years. I was just I was depressed bro. Like I was up there in Boston and it's not really like the part of Boston I was in, like old people that look like you know how black people do this. <laughs> there was no people that really looked like us and whatnot. Uh especially in the program I was in, so I was just having a rough time and uh, I did some self reflection and like kinda did an outlook on my life being alone. Kind of realized like it's not really what I want to do, and it's not what I'm passionate about. So I just kind of like sat back and reflected on, damn, what am I passionate about? What's kind of always been around, uh, you know, throughout my life that I've been like up and down. It always stayed there and always kept me in a happy spot, happy place. And it was the music. Mm. Um, I definitely think we need more black individuals in the program that you were talking about, because <laughs> I can only imagine. But I also want to say, you know, for people that are going to college, because you went straight after high school. Yeah. So I did too, but I should have took like a little break to kind of reflect because we've been in school all our life. And so when I went to my first school, I ended up getting kicked out just because I wasn't, man, I, I wasn't taking it serious or whatever. But then I went to art school for film and stuff like that, which is what, you know, but if I had that time to reflect before that, I would have probably just you know, did that, been more conscious. Because I was low key depressed. Too. I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> but it's like, bro, it's kind of like everything happens for a reason, you know. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I, I was like, damn, why the fuck did I go to college and shit like that? But I'm like, damn, at the same time, I'm meeting people that I became lifelong friends with, and a lot of people that kind of helped me with the music and whatnot. Like my main producer, I met in Boston at school, you know what I'm saying? So it's like everything kind of just happens for a reason. You got it comes around full circle, so it has its pros and its cons. But I say, like, if you're not really passionate about school, so now you're in school going for this master's program. Now what? And then you decide to take a step back from it. What about with your mom? How does she take it? <laughs> you already know how it is, bro. Like with moms, like they're protective of their children, especially like their, their children's like future and whatnot. School is kind of a safe route, you know. It's a safe route. Um, uh, when I told her I wanted to do music. I remember that conversation. Like, I was on the phone with her. I called her and whatnot. Told her about like some exam I had. I think I failed it or whatnot. I failed it basically because I wasn't really trying anymore. I'm, that was kind of like my last straw. So I'm on the phone with her. I'm telling her, like I just want to do music. My mom ain't really. She wasn't happy about it. You know what I'm saying? She started kind of yelling at me and shit through the phone. I had to. You know what I'm saying? Take a step back for the phone. Cause you doing that type of it's thing. real. Yeah, so, but like, after my mom like heard my music, she realized like, rap. And she had never heard me rap before that. But I had homeboys that heard me rap and I kind of knew like what I was capable of with my music. So, kind of like what it was. Like after she heard, heard me spit, heard my tape and whatnot, so I was serious about it. I was, you know, hopped on board with it. That's good. And this, I was about to say, and it's good to have your mom like um, on your side or whatever, because my mom, Lord have mercy, she just like, get a job. Get a job. But she supports me. She's probably definitely one of my biggest supporters and has support me, but goddamn, get a job. <laughs> we trying, mom. We trying. <laughs> um, and we're going to make it. Um, okay. Are you signed to any label, anything like that? Or are you independent? I'm independent. Uh, I got a deal, a distribution deal with uh EQ. Um, like a they under the umbrella of Rock Nation and whatnot. So. Um, okay. So what I want to do? Are you trying to get signed? Or are you trying to stay independent? I know it just depends, man. Right now, like it just depends on you know where I'm at, you know, with my career, and whatnot, and you know, actually what they're talking about and whatnot. So Fact. Works for me, you know. But uh, I'm definitely trying to be on a global level, so. To see you know, what your label can do. Yeah, or what a label can do, you know what I'm saying? Take you there. So. Um, 
Okay, so what uh do you know what an elevator pitch is? If not, it's elevator pitch, like a little come on like a little three minute, thirty second yeah. like, pitch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So basically I'm gonna paint this scenario, okay? And within this scenario, I'm gonna have you pitch yourself to these record label executives on why they should sign you. Okay? And you got one minute to do so. Okay? All right, so here's the scenario. <laughs> All right, so we're in a big corporate building, right? Big corporate building, skyscraper, it looks official. So at the top floor, we get on the elevator. Who's on this elevator? I'm on this elevator. You're on this elevator. We got Rock Nation executives on this elevator. We got Bad Boy executives. We got OVO, Drake's crew. So who's who's on this elevator, right? Um, so now on the way down, you got one minute to pitch to them on why they should sign you and do business with you. Okay? Ready? And go. Yo, uh, I just want to introduce myself. I don't want to take up too much of your time. But I go by 912 King. Um, I'm from Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, I'm very passionate about my music, and um, I did my research on who you are, so that's why I'm introducing myself to you, because I know you can uh, you know, take my career to a level that I envision it, you know, so um, if, you, if it is what it is, man, I would like to, you know what I'm saying, hand you my flash drive, you know, so you can check out my check out my music when you're free, so appreciate your time, you know. There you go, and just in we'll case... Sweet, you know, don't want to do too much. As you should, because it'd be somehow, oh, let me take a picture. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, if you got somebody with you, they might can do all that, whatever, but, you know, you keep cool. Um, so just in case, like, an executive or somebody comes across this clip or whatever, what's your social media so they can find you? Oh, so it's just my uh, my stage name. Now I'm with two team on everything. Um, yeah. Team is spelled. Team is spelled K-E-E-M, M as in money. 912 King. Um, okay. I like that. That was good. Um, and that was the first time somebody ever put me on the spot like that. No. Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. Trust me. You got to be ready. Especially, you be ready. and you out here South by Southwest. You never know who yeah. you're going to see, bro. Because I know for sure Chris Gotti going to be at your event. Um, that's coming up. So, you know, that might be a little connect. You can make happen. I only have 30 seconds with the boy. Exactly. I got to pull up on him, you know. Um, I'm glad that you're also, like, before we did that, you said something that I'm glad you're aware of. You said you're trying to be global. And I'm glad that you're aware that a label can accelerate that. You know, you can possibly do it without it, but a label will definitely accelerate that. What are some other benefits you think uh, uh, come with signing with a label? Just access to the resources. Um, I'm from a small town, so, like, resources are very limited and, like, rare. So, like, just being in a big city where, you know those labels are and whatnot, and just having access to like different things. And it's not like a wealth of knowledge one for many uh, either. So you know, just rubbing shoulders with the right people and just picking up, picking up phone, you know, big time respect and whatnot. So um, nah, I feel that one hundred percent. What music are you working on right now? Uh, so I'm working on a project called Raise Wicked. Um, it's kind of really already done. I kind of want to put like the music is done, but I kind of want to make it flow better. And so that's what I'm working on. When you say flow, like the track selections or just like the track selection and like, you know, just add more skits and whatnot, making it more of a story. Yeah, yeah, interludes and whatnot. So I'm working on that. And also I got like some singles uh, I'm going to release, you know. You know what I'm saying? They not project. They not, they don't belong in a project, but they can stand alone. That's what I was about to ask. Were they attached to the project? Or so, but they're separate. But they're gonna lead up to the project. Lead up to the project. Fire. Um. So let's talk about the situation you was involved in, man. Um. Let's talk about the how. Let's give it play by play. Give us a play by. Uh. So for those that aren't familiar, um, uh, with Ahmad Arbery's death, he was the young black man that uh took a job, went out for a run, and got killed by. Uh, three white men, and um, you know, it kind of, you know, it was a tragedy and whatnot. And uh, come to find out, like they said, he ended up, they ended up lying about how he was killed, and um, they said he was involved in like a burg burglary or whatnot. And uh, come to find out after doing like my research and um, you know, his family members doing their research and whatnot, particularly his mom and whatnot, and uh, they ended up like realizing they lied about that and they tried to sweep his his murder under the rug, under the rug. So I was kind of heavily involved in, uh, you know, just bringing that to light and getting into like 
Yeah, man, I definitely remember that story. My mom had brought it up to me. She was saying, like, yeah, three <clears throat> three white guys was trailing this guy that was running or whatever. They said he was, you know, there had been burglaries or whatever, so they thought it was him. Now, these people are not police. <laughs> Don't know, trying to get involved. That's the, that's like, behind, that's like part of the corruption, too, though. One of the dudes was, he used to be a former investigator with uh, Greg and Michael Greg. Yeah, he was a corrupt dude. Uh, police force was trying to help. <laughs> it was something. So, so um, I'm sure there was a lot of protesting. I know there was a lot of protesting. Were you involved in any of that? I was involved in the protest, but like, you know, like this has happened like, you know, multiple times. It keeps happening, keeps reoccurring and whatnot. I wanted to do like more than just kind of protest, you know. I wanted to actually like put together like actual like force behind, you know what I'm saying, get some real change going. And uh, so we was actually, me and like uh, a group of men, we actually kind of like strategized on ways to kind of get this thing like to the national news, to the New York Times and whatnot. So we actually took steps like emailing the DA's office, emailing the police department and stuff like that kind of like peer back on like what's really going on, what, where's the where's the police report at and things like that, just to see who all was involved and like what actually took place instead of just going off, you know, like were they cooperative or was that a hassle for those <laughs> It wasn't man, you know, it was trying to like give us no no we got a ho- whole lot of no's, a whole lot of like, you know what I'm saying? It took like a group of people in order for them to respond and re- respond to us and reply and things like that. So a whole lot of pushback at first, but you know what I'm saying? We, we didn't stop. We didn't stop. We kept going, you know? And that's kind of like what happened. Yeah. I'm forcing them to give us answers. That's good. Somebody got to do it. We can't let them just, you know, walk all over us or do whatever they want to do when they in the wrong, you know what I'm saying? Which which I definitely, what, what, um, Year was that? Was that during COVID? Yep, during COVID. <laughs> right before it happened. Yep. So like, um, so I was in New York when I found out he died. You know, uh, it was like late at night. His sister texted me. She said we lost, we lost bro and whatnot at the house. So I was just in shock. Just remember crying that whole night, and I called my other homies. Let them know what happened. But um, yeah, we uh, like after after I found out he died, I went down to his funeral and whatnot. It just wasn't sitting right with it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was uneasy about it because it was like it was like it was, a, it was too premature. Like he was gone way too soon and whatnot. So I was just like kind of just I was stuck, bro. I was kind of confused and whatnot, and I didn't feel like doing nothing where I was at, like because of that. Stop. And then the damn, and then the pandemic came. So I'm like, damn, like it's like everything just coming. You know what I'm saying? Then in New York, it's rough out there. You know. Definitely. Yeah. So it's like, damn, I, I'm still trying to find a job out there, whatnot. My homie just died. Pandemic just came. Like my music really had to, I had to put that shit on hold because I had to handle some other things first. I had to prioritize. So I kind of took a step back from the music and just did my research on that. Uh, I think you did therapy also. Right? Yeah, bro, I did therapy because I was uh, I was spiraling out of control, bro. Uh, I was just finding different coping mechanisms that were kind of like just not really healthy for me and whatnot. Exactly. So I just just had to take a step back and just kind of had to talk about it. It was a lot of energy being uh, pumped up in me that was kind of just it was destroying me, you know. So I had to just had to just find a way to speak. And so after therapy, how did it? Did you feel any better? A little more at ease. I felt a little better. Uh, I did therapy for uh, probably a few months, uh, but I also at the same time I was doing like I was taking boxing classes and whatnot, and I think that was pretty. That was kind of I felt like that was kind of more helpful. Therapy in its own way. Yeah, therapy in its own way, a way for me to release like anger and keep it more controlled and whatnot.